Some men just want to watch Mexico burn. In the introduction to La Vida, famed anthropologist Oscar Lewis unfavorably compares Puerto Rico to Mexico. But perhaps the crucial difference in the history of the two countries was the development of a great revolutionary tradition in Mexico and its absence in Puerto Rico. Puerto Ricans sought greater autonomy from Spain during the 19th century, but they were never able to organize a revolutionary struggle for their freedom, and the single attempt along this line at Lar was short-lived and never received mass support. By contrast, the Mexicans fought for their independence from Spain between 1810 and 1821, drove out the French in 1866, and later produced the Great Revolution of 1910-20 with its glorious ideals of social justice. In the course of these struggles, great heroes emerged, men who have become symbols of the Mexican spirit of revolution and independence. La Vida was published in 1965 just 45 years after the end of the Mexican Revolution. Lewis personally knew many Mexicans who lived through it. But what actually happened during this great revolution with its glorious ideals of social justice? The best paper I could find on the topic is Robert McCass, 2003 Missing Millions, The Demographic Costs of the Mexican Revolution. After a detailed review of earlier estimates, Macaw deploys new techniques to reach a grim conclusion. The human cost of the revolution was paid mainly in blood. Of a total demographic cost of 200.1 million, excess deaths accounted for two-thirds, lost births one-fourth, and emigration considerably less than one-tenth of the total the best two-sex inverse projection to 1930, taking into account the age and sex distribution of the population in that year, points to some three million missing as of 1921. Census error in the 1921 enumeration reduces this figure by one million. Two-thirds of the remainder was due to one factor, excess mortality, 1.4 million deaths, with 350,000 more male deaths than female. Lost births were substantially less at 550,000. Smaller still, at less than 10% of the total loss, was emigration to the United States, with the persisting number of male refugees, generously defined, slightly more than 100,000, and females about three-fourths of this figure. The basic history of the Mexican Revolution, moreover, was hardly heroic. Only six months passed between Francisco Buert Al Madero's pronouncement of revolution, November 20th, 1910, and the overthrow of the old dictator, Porfirio Daz. The resignation of Daz came in late spring 1911 and was accomplished with little violence or destruction. The fighting scarcely began until 1911. Victory at Ciudad Jurez came to the revolutionaries on May 10th, 1911, after a siege lasting only a couple of days. Although the fall of Daz was achieved due to uprisings throughout the Republic, the cost of the revolution, to this point, was probably only a few thousand deaths. The real fighting began as the revolutionaries trained their weapons on one another over the course of the following six years. Zapata, having waited four months to rebel against the hated Daz, did not allow four weeks to pass before rebelling against the enormously popular Madero. In late November 1911, Zapata, tired of waiting for Madero to carry through an agrarian revolution, according to the conventional view, denounced Mexico's first democratically elected president by proclaiming the plan of Ayala. Yet, until 1912, Zapatistas did not pose a serious threat to the Madero government. Elsewhere, regional bands and bandits, some with plans, others without, escalated the plundering of the countryside, hamlets, and towns. As is well known, within two years of Da's resignation, the nation slid into chaos. With the assassination of Madero on February 21, 1913, probably on the order of the Madero appointed commander in chief of the Federal Army, Victoriano Hirtahivil War erupted. The usurper proved incapable of suppressing the many revolts. After the failure of the Convention of Aguascalientes to resolve the differences of regional warlords, an even bloodier phase of the revolution began as, once again, the victors turned on one another. The year 1915 was the year of hunger. Marauding bands destroyed the few crops that were sown. 
many before they could be harvested. Destruction continued into 1916, although with the defeat of the northern chieftain Pancho Villa at the Battle of Celaya in April 1915, the violence began to wane, however slowly. Devastation was made worse by the Spanish influenza epidemic of 1918 and 19, to be examined in detail below. McKay thoughtfully concludes, Given the magnitude of the human losses caused by the Mexican Revolution, the silence of some scholars and disbelief by others is surprising. For the Americas, both North and South, the Mexican Revolution was the greatest demographic catastrophe of the 20th century. From a millennial perspective, the human cost of the Mexican Revolution was exceeded only by the devastation of Christian conquest, colonization, and accompanying epidemics nearly four centuries earlier. How then could as knowledgeable a scholar as Lewis credulously praise the sordid bloodbath that was the Mexican Revolution? As a Marxist, he was obviously predisposed to positivity. His gushing, however, would probably resonate with many non-Marxists, too. So what would possess anyone to so gush? One could say, you can't make huevos rancheros without breaking eggs. The war was tragic, but the results were great. Since we're talking about Mexico, though, this seems absurd. Sure, it's a middle-income country, but given its proximity to the U.S., gravity alone should have turned it into a peaceful, first-world country by now. Violence, moreover, remains a grave problem to this day. The legacy of the Mexican Revolution is one of the better explanations for why a peaceful, prosperous Mexico has yet to emerge. In any case, people who admire revolutions rarely bother with counterfactual history. What excites them is revolution itself. Revolution is romantic. The vision of tearing down the wickedness of the world, serving wrongdoers their just deserts charging barricades with our brave leaders and building a better world on top of the ashes is a thrilling story. Counting corpses and asking, what was it all for in contrast, is a real downer. If you share this romantic vision, you might even welcome my analysis. Yes, I'm inspired by revolutionary idealism. At least they tried. Yet calmly considered, this romantic vision is inexcusable. Launching a bloody war without even asking how likely is this war to improve the world is as romantic as drunk driving on a playground. Giving revolutionaries credit for trying is ridiculous. If you combine brutality with wishful thinking about the consequences, your real goal isn't to make those consequences a reality. Your real goal is just to exercise brutality. So why did Lewis gush over the Mexican Revolution? Batman's butler got it right. Well, because he thought it was good sport. Because some men aren't looking for anything logical like money. They can't be bought, bullied, reasoned, or negotiated with. Some men just want to watch the world burn. I've learned a lot from Lewis, but the less real-world influence people like him have, the better. March 12, 2019